Hi guys, and welcome back to The Carla Garrick Show. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, we'll be talking about three things today. I'm gonna be launching my uh, Sense of Self series. That is going to be a short segment that I hope to do every week, where we just kind of talk about what it is to like, you know, think about who you are, what your sense of self is, and I'm gonna explore words uh, that have to do with self. So this week we will be talking about self-control. We'll be talking about self-control because one of the segments will also be about fasting. For those of you who've been following along for a while know that about four or five years ago, I had a radical change in my lifestyle. I lost about 65 pounds following a keto or low carb diet. And, um, and I have found that fasting is really a really fantastic tool to both keep myself healthy, but also to make sure that I'm maintaining my weight at a healthy level. So we'll be talking about that. And then we will also be talking about the one, the only Elon Musk. So that's what's coming up in this edition of the Carla Garrick Show. I'm so glad you guys are with me here here today again. Let's get started. So fasting, how hard is it? Why do people do it? Should you try it at home? What does it look like? All of that good stuff. Of course, the internet is full of useful information. Someone I've been following for a while is Dr. Jason Fung. He is a specialist in fasting, and you can certainly go to YouTube, that's F-U-N-G, and take a look at the work that he has up there. A few terms I think we should talk about first. So what is keto? Um, you might hear the term keto, you might hear the words paleo, um, and low carb. These are more or less all the same stuff, but basically what you want to do is if you're following a keto lifestyle, and I like to think about it as a lifestyle, not a diet. And I think that's a reframing that anyone who's watching this should really think about, right? When you say the words diet, you tend to think something is temporary or it's only going to last for a certain period of time. But if you think about something as a lifestyle, then it's something you're adopting as an actual habit. And so switch your thinking from diet to lifestyle. Once you do that, what does that lifestyle look like? What is keto? So keto or paleo is basically a low carb diet where you use uh, low carb. So what does that mean? What is a carb? A carb is basically sugar and some form, right? Um, it's things like uh, processed foods. It's, uh, you can find all the info online, but basically it's, um, you want to avoid carbs and you want to eat medium protein and you want to eat high good fats. What are high good fats? These are things like coconut oil, avocado oil. I like to cook with my avocado oil because it is it has a very high heat flash point, so it's great for those of us who like to do our grilling, uh, using our skillets, and maybe for the folks back home who do not know, I also have a very casual Sunday sometimes cooking show. It's called Freedom Nom Nom or Freedom Nom Nom, and you can find that on the Freedom Nom Nom playlist at Carla Garrick on YouTube, and that's my YouTube channel, Carla Garrick TV. So go take a look at that. Basically there what I do is I take, um, you know, just known recipes, something like shepherd's pie, and I take it from a high carb version into a low carb, delicious, yummy version. So keto, low carb, medium protein, high good fats. If you're anything like me, the biggest adjustment uh, to switching to this lifestyle was accepting that fat doesn't make you fat and that fat is not bad for you. If, like me, you grew up in the 80s, uh, the Jane Fonda era, uh, you know, we, we really grew up in that, that environment of low fat is good for you. Turns out low fat is really, really crap. 
Also turns out the other culprit is seed oils. So if you have seed oils in your house, you probably want to be looking at that. What are those? That's sunflower seed. It's all the stuff that they deep fry stuff in. Um, it is extremely bad for your health. So that is something to go look at. If you're eating something like margarine, you probably want to replace it with butter again. I know it sounds crazy. I actually cannot convince my own mother that she should listen to me about this. So I understand the conditioning is there. We were told fat's bad for us. Turns out the FDA was wrong about that too. Big whoop. All right, so back to fasting. First of all, the term intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is something that you can introduce into your life. Basically, that just means you're taking big chunks of windows of time during which you're not eating. So by way of example, I do a daily intermittent fasting. I fast from around eight o'clock at night. I try and actually make that a little earlier, but for the sake of argument, we'll say eight, from eight to at least noon the next day. Um, that is a good chunk of time. And I know, again, the conditioning we were told is that breakfast is the most important meal. It may be for some people, uh, but generally it really is not. And the fact that we, we have that time period during which we're sleeping, the longer you can extend that, the better for you. So you're really looking for big chunks of time that you could not eat in. We in America have created this incredibly unhealthy culture. I mean, the majority, I believe the majority is now obese. Uh, the majority of children are uh, trending towards obesity. I don't think it's quite at 50% of children who are obese. And this is a real problem because we are creating a generation of people who don't even know what it feels like to be healthy. I had a very, very distinct experience when I lost 65 pounds. Now I was a skinny, healthy, jockey, kid, nerd, the whole thing. Uh, so I was very healthy through to when I moved to America and people started putting, you know, salad sized bowls of pasta in front of me and told me that's how you're supposed to eat, right? Carbs, 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 just carbs everywhere. And, um, and so I gained a lot of weight when I came to the States. So I'm pretty much back to like my regular size. I mean, I could probably get a little skin here, but you know, whatever. So, um, so when I lost the weight, I actually realized, oh, wow, I feel like a child again. Like I feel like myself. I feel like what I remember from, from my youth. And with the obesity trend in this country and actually spreading globally, the issue becomes these children don't even know how it feels to be healthy. And if you're fat, you don't want to exercise and you don't want to go outside. You don't want to get the sunlight. You don't want to get the fresh air. You don't want to eat the dirt and do all the stuff that we know is vitally important for our immune systems. So really, this is a national and global problem and I'm doing my little bit to try and reverse it. So fasting, when you do a longer fast than an intermittent fast, you could do one day, you could do two day, you could do three, five, seven. People, there's a dude I read about who, I mean, he weighed like something like 500 pounds when he started, so don't do this at home. But he, uh, he fasted for, I believe, an entire year. That was under medical supervision, so like don't try this at home. But basically, here are three quick tips for fasting. And so that you know, I've done, I, you know, I do the intermittent fasting. So I do the, you know, 12 to 14 hours daily. I try and do a five-day fast once a quarter. So that would be five days uh, every quarter. So that's 20 days over the year. Uh, weird little side effect or advantage of it would be that you... Um, save money and you get a lot of time back. But so here are three tips for fasting. Maybe start with your first one. And I would highly recommend actually starting to become fat adapted or reducing your sugar consumption before you try this. 
because the more reliant you are on glucose as an energy source as opposed to um, fat, you will become quite hungry. So there are some steps to do here, but for those of you who are curious, here are the top three tips that uh, Dr. Jason Fung sort of talks about on one of his videos. And um, the first one is find a friend to fast with. Why is this? We know having a friend to help you with whatever you're doing creates accountability. So, you know, go out, find that person. I'm extremely fortunate that my partner in life, Louis, uh, my husband of like almost 30 years at this stage, uh, is also super into all this stuff. In fact, he's the more science minded. So he finds these things and then he kind of takes me along for the ride. Uh, so we, t we fast together. So he's my accountability buddy. The next thing you want to do, so one is find a friend to do it with. Two is make it a habit. As I just explained to you, uh, figuring out where it fits on your calendar, where it's a good time to do it, uh, makes it routine. And anything that's routine is something that becomes a lot easier to do because again, it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. Once it's a habit and a retreat, uh, routine, it's internalized. And then you can um, just do it as part of your life. The third tip is put it on your schedule because if you don't have it on your schedule, you're not going to do it. If this is something you're more curious about, please go to my website, carlagarrick.com. I have many personal stories about my journey, about how I lost the weight, how I've kept it off, and how you too can change your life for the better so that you can live free and thrive. Elon Musk. Now, what can one say? I mean, I'm 100% willing to admit that I have a total girl crush on him, mostly because I feel like we have such overlapping stories, to be honest. So for those of you who don't know, Elon Musk is originally from South Africa, as am I. We're about the same age. We have very similar origin stories, although he's clearly good at science and math and, you know, me, not so much. I mean, I can hold my own, but I definitely can't put a rocket in space to go to Mars. So years ago, I wrote an open letter to Elon Musk, inviting him to the Porcupine Freedom Festival, which is the Free State Project's uh, premier summer event that we hold in June every year. It'll be June 20th through the 26th this year up in Lancaster, New Hampshire, at Rogers Campground. So if you were under a rock, let me give you the quick, fast breakdown of what just happened. So Elon Musk bought Twitter. The entire world or the lefty world or the progressive world or the pro-censorship people or the, uh, you know, anti-free speech people are uh, super upset. Super upset. But here's a quick rundown. And again, you can go to carlagarrick.com and look up. I did a, uh, is Elon Musk going to buy Twitter? Maybe blog post from last week where I updated it as uh, more news came in. But basically what happened was he made an offer to Twitter, to the shareholders and the board, uh, with a premium offer of $54.20, which was, you know, a very, very attractive offer. The board initially said no. Vanguard and BlackRock, two evil big corporations that are basically buying up the entire world, and I think they're part of the cabal who wants to put us in pods and feed us insect gruel, but be that as it may, try to buy enough shares. The Twitter board and the employees actually employed a poison pill, which, as the name suggests, is something you kind of do to hurt yourself. It's actually historically from the pill that spies would bite and take uh, in order to, you know, not divulge your secrets. So, I mean, that's kind of weird. The poison pill was the idea that they could dilute through the employees and through other shareholders the amount of shares that are available to try and make the amount that he was offering less. So that didn't work. They did take his offer down to about 18%, but then that didn't work either. Then... Twitter hired Goldman Sachs, 
uh, to advise them on whether this was a good deal. Now, in corporate law, and I have to be candid, I was like running around the kitchen acting like a crazy lady because I was like, ah, because Louis came in and I was like, let me tell you what's happening with Twitter. And he was like, geez, calm down, lady. And I was like, no, this is my gem, right? Because my background is a corporate attorney for tech companies in Silicon Valley back in the day when it was the dot-com boom and then, of course, the bust. And, um, and so everything about this was just like, ah, this is so exciting. I know exactly what's happening, right? So after the poison pill, they hire Goldman Sachs. Now, one of the things is your board in any corporate environment has a fiduciary duty to act in good faith, which means they have to entertain a offer that is an attractive offer at face value, and they can't actually decline it, or they shouldn't. And if they do, they open themselves up to shareholder lawsuits. And I think they all knew this, because the fait accompli, as they say, was that Goldman Sachs then claimed last Friday for a hot second this is why they want to censor stuff, because we can find all the information now. Um, they were like, oh, this isn't a reasonable offer, except Goldman Sachs had a offer to buy at $30, and he was he was buy sell $30 and Elon Musk was offering $54.20 as the premium. So they didn't have a leg to stand on. So I'm pretty sure over the weekend, uh, people got together and, you know, had their hysterical crying and bowling and, uh, you know, all of that and treat yourself if you're interested in this uh, to go look at some of the meltdowns uh, from the employees at Twitter. You know, you have to ask yourself, and I mean this genuinely and quite seriously, what is going on in the world or in America, or at least with, it seems, the maybe younger generation where they can't entertain ideas without like... <clears throat> It makes no sense. Free speech exists so that we can express ourselves, so that we can figure out things about life, right? So why anyone would be like, I don't want to hear your ideas and I'm not willing to entertain it, I don't know. So anyway, so then uh, yesterday, or I guess maybe, well, this week sometime, the board then said, fine, we're going to accept it. The deal was uh, signed. Uh, things are now in motion. Employees are leaving. There's all this stuff. Um, and now I think what's going to happen is we are going to navigate this landscape of what would a free speech platform or as Elon likes to call it sort of the public square, what would that look like? Now, as a, uh, you know, as a libertarian, I would actually just like to see it be fully deregulated, let people figure it out. Everyone has the block button, so you could just get rid of people you don't want to deal with. That's entirely reasonable. There, you, you know, people have a right to speak. They can't force you to listen, right? Um, but one of the suggestions I actually floated is maybe they could institute three levels of use, right? So you could have users who come in and we could even make them color coded. So you could say, I am someone who only wants to see government improved propaganda, government approved information. I only want to know what the CDC and the FDA has to say about anything or, you know, whatever agency, uh, FBI, CIA, whatever, right? So um, so you could say, okay, I'm a user who only wants government-approved information. Maybe we could have a user level that says, I like a curated feed, but I only want to listen to these people on top of the government, right? And maybe we make that orange. So government-approved, I would make red. Then I would say, okay, a curated level could be like an orange. And then a green level is a free-for-all. That is where people go who actually want to figure out for themselves what the world looks like. Uh, an aside to James Dore, who today on Twitter told me I'm not allowed to have opinions because um, I'm not an expert. I'm like, yeah, dude, okay, you know what? Experts do so what? 
we can all listen to whom we want to listen to. And so I would have the free for all, the green, the go do and learn what you want. So with the Elon, um, stuff. I think it's going to be very interesting. I do think Twitter is going to move towards an authentication structure, which means people won't be able to have the anonymous accounts. Now, I personally believe that you should stand behind your words and it should be reputation based. But, you know, I can understand uh, the concerns from people who maybe uh, desire an anonymity. Um, there is a concern with something like whistleblowing. So that is something we would have to look at. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this public square actually is navigated. But I will tell you that from yesterday to today, we are seeing it's a lot more robust and lively. I'm seeing a lot of accounts come back. I'm seeing a lot of data come out from, from you know, the, the anti-mandate side, maybe some of the scientists who were silenced and all of that. So stay tuned. I will keep you updated on what is happening. But also to leave you for this segment with the following. Um, this is again a clip. Um, it, it is uh, Tucker Carlson talking to a lawyer who is suing Twitter for various violations of uh, speech issues. So the clip's about three minutes long. And I think it just sort of summarizes some of what we were talking about and then also um, tells you just a little bit of, of you know, where, where, what people are thinking. So this is a, it's actually, if you get into the details, pretty complicated. How exactly do you fix Twitter's free speech problem? Well, first, Elon Musk has in its hands uh, one of the most important, perhaps the most important free speech vehicles in the world right now. And yeah. so he has an opportunity to change the discourse in this country for the better. And I think there are a few simple things he can do. First of all, you got to move Twitter out of San Francisco and out of California yes. altogether. And one of the big problems in these big tech companies has been how they are overwhelmingly left wing. And that is what you see in the bias in how these companies moderate speech and content. So if he moves it to Florida, to Texas, to frankly, any place in America outside California, I think that would be a huge improvement. Yes. Um, I've seen calls to fire employees. I wouldn't do that. I think that's, you know, extreme and also has liability issues. But I think you could ask people to reapply for the position they want in the company and then see if they're willing to go along with some of these new policies that I'm talking about. I think one of the important things that uh, Elon Musk needs to do is let back on to Twitter people who have been banned. And there are a lot of uh, people, including clients of my firm. Uh, Rogan O'Hanley is currently suing Twitter. We also represent some meme meisters like Carpe Donctum and a Megan Murphy, a feminist, a radical Canadian feminist who was kicked off of Twitter for so-called misgendering. All of these people, I think, bringing them back on would actually increase popularity and uh, traffic on Twitter, which is what a business should want. And then I think, you know, just going back to something very simple that we learn as children, to be honest and transparent. That has been tremendously lacking in Twitter. Twitter has lied about how it has put its finger on the scale about election yes. interference until after the fact. Twitter is not transparent about its policies, its algorithms. Twitter is not transparent about uh, how people are removed from the platform. And Twitter is not transparent, frankly, about who its users are. I think uh, Elon Musk has talked about removing the bots from Twitter. I think that would tremendously improve the user experience. So if he's, like, there are a lot of complicated issues here, Tucker, and I'm sure he's getting advice from all over the place. And of course, I'm suing Twitter. So uh, you know, that is uh, certainly a factor in what, uh, what I have to say here. But I think if he wants to make a fresh start of this amazing company with tremendous value and potential for free speech, he can do all of these things. And the final thing I would say is um, continue to strike that blow for free speech that he's been doing on Twitter for the last few days. The United States government is coming for Elon Musk. They're coming with today's announcement of this disinformation uh, panel that they're going to have to examine so-called disinformation governance panel. Um, that is really the government trying to impose the censorship that Elon Musk is saying is no longer going to going to exist on Twitter. So yeah. I think we all need to stand together for that and have open and fresh conversations. I'm looking forward to being on Twitter for many years, hopefully with the fresh leadership. So as you heard in that clip, um, a couple of additional things. 
I did invite Mr. Elon Musk to move Twitter to the free state of New Hampshire. Uh, if you're on Twitter, go look for that tweet and show it some support. I was half kidding, but I'm actually quite serious. You know, there was a CEO back uh, from Zappos. He unfortunately did pass away from an overdose a few years ago, but they moved their entire company to downtown Las Vegas um, and used some funds to sort of revitalize the area. So who knows, maybe Elon can buy Berlin and or Franconia or someplace and all the lefty progressives who don't want to move and who want to stay in Feces-ville there in California could stay there and we could get all the innovative pioneers to move to the great state of New Hampshire and we could get this digital revolution on the road. Another thing she talked about there and uh, Tucker sort of alluded to is there was this horrifying announcement that Biden made yesterday where basically the U.S. government is declaring war on, on free speech. They, they are going to introduce some kind of disinformation committee, panel, something, whatever it is, it's misnamed. Uh, for those of you who have read Orwell's 1984, you know what they're talking about is the Ministry of Truth. If you're George Bush, it's probably the Ministry of Truthiness, but be it as it may, this is the antithesis of anything this country stands for. And if you care about America, you should care about free speech. It is not as the people alluded to that, you know, someone actually said this. I saw this tweet go by that Elon Musk want, wants to buy Twitter so white people can say the N-word. Um, and my response was, do you mean the N-word being the Nuremberg Code? The ethical rules that came out of Nazism to say this is not how we act towards humans and these are the rules for human experimentation, which were violated by Big Pharma and your government colluding together to give these emergency authorizations for the vaccines because that is actually what happened. And that is why they want to control the information because we're winning. We are winning. So you get rid of bad ideas. And I say most of what government thinks are bad ideas. They were wrong about the food pyramid that made everyone fat and gave everyone type 2 diabetes that we now have to reverse. They were wrong about masks. They're wrong about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines and at a minimum about the transmission uh, issue there. Uh, they were wrong about Pretty much everything, monetary policy, inflation is transitory, um, all the stuff they tell you are lies. And for the first time in human history, we have the tools to point out the lies, to prove the hypocrisy, to put quotes where they are literally saying one thing on one day and saying another thing the other day next to each other so that you and I can see what is happening. And this is why your government wants to introduce a ministry of truth. So we are not going to accept that. And deeply, gratefully, from my heart, thank you, Elon Musk, a immigrant like me from South Africa who grew up under apartheid. We grew up under a police state. We know what this stuff looks like. We see that it is here, and we are fighting our damnedest to stop it from happening in this country. And you should stand with us and not fight us. And I'm speaking to the progressives of New Hampshire. We have a duty to make this state as great as we can. And it's up to you and you guys need to stop fighting us because we have the ideas and we know what we're talking about. We predicted every single thing that is currently happening. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about the Sense of Self series. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm trying to cheat, right? Like one of my life goals now is to make everything that I do, one thing should inform another so that as I create digital content and written content and more content and actually become like a producer of stuff that hopefully people will consume, um, I need to make sure I'm using my time correctly, right? I mean, time is our lives. It is 
the only real currency we have to spend. And so I'm trying to make little pieces of everything I do fit together so that if I'm doing this, I have something over here. So this one is actually to, I'm working on a book. Um, it's gonna be called Selfish. And um, I'm just going to take sort of this notion of the self and try and expand it to help people who have not heard these ideas, have not been taught these ideas, have not, you know, the only thing you're ever told is being selfish is wrong. Well, I say the opposite is true. I say being selfish, meaning taking care of yourself, is your only duty to the common good. That is the only thing you should be doing. If you're unhealthy, you need to get healthy. You don't need to tell other people to do something to their bodies like wear a mask because you're unhealthy. You need to figure your stuff out. And I'm trying to give you the tools to do it because if I can do it, you can do it. That's what I'm here for. So the sense of self series, the first thing to understand is what is the self? Like, like, like what is a sense of self? So the best notion or the best way I've heard it explained is when you truly have a sense of self, it means that your mind and your body are in balance. And that means that you're healthy, right? So in order for your mind to be in balance, you need to not have double think in the Orwellian sense, or the modern term for double think is cognitive dissonance. So you need to figure out what you think about things for yourself, not based on what someone else told you, but what you think, and make sure that that is in balance so that your mind and your thoughts and your actions are in balance. Then you want to take your body and make sure that that too is in balance. The way you get your body in balance is to do things like making sure you're eating right. We talked about that earlier on the show. Making sure you're getting enough sleep. I can't say it enough times, guys. We know lack of sleep is a form of torture. So switch off the TV, switch off your computer, get into bed, read a little, and go to sleep. So that's it for this week. But again, I'm going to start to break down the words from self. We'll do things like self-esteem. We'll do things like self-control. We'll do things like feeling self-conscious. And so every week, I'm going to take one of those, and we're going to talk about them. So that's where we are. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of the Carla Garrick Show. Tune in again next week. In the meanwhile, thanks so much, and together we can live free and thrive.